Hi, everyone. Happy Webinar Wednesday. I'm Maria Yulia, Chief of Staff at Ecomap Technologies, and I'm thrilled to have you all here for our ecosystem talks. Today, we're hosting a masterclass led by Adriana Delgetta Cosgrove, who is the CEO of Capacita Consulting, a mission-driven consulting company that assists both nonprofits and funders to remove obstacles, build skills, and solve problems. Adriana is an attorney and former supervisory foreign affairs officer at the U.S. Department of State with expertise in implementing structural reforms and innovations in the U.S. and internationally. She's also a grant maker and foreign, assist foreign assistance program manager focusing on criminal justice reform. She is a leader of diverse international teams and studied organizational psychology at Harvard College. Um, with her capacity team, she focuses on strategy, capacity building, and fundraising for nonprofits with expertise in grants. In this session, Adriana will equip you with the knowledge and tools needed to craft compelling grant proposals. We are so excited to have you today, Adriana, and I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much. I don't think I'll ever get used to somebody reading my bio in front of me. It just feels so. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the whole Ecomap team. I really appreciate the invite. We've been working with Ecomap, partnering on a couple of projects lately, and it's been lovely. And it was a real pleasure to say yes to this today. We're going to talk about one of my favorite things, grants. Um, so let's get right into the PowerPoint. All right. Harnessing the power of grants. So we are gonna get into a lot of information today. Um, and I very much encourage questions at the end. This usually takes me about 45, 50 minutes to get through, but we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end to make sure that you feel like uh, you have your chance to ask the burning questions that come to you as I'm talking. So let me start by telling you a little bit about Capacita. I know Maria already gave you a little bit of an update, but that's a few of my teammates there, not the whole crew. And then that's a picture of a facilitation that we did at the bottom, but we help mission-driven organizations. So this includes nonprofits, schools, for-profit organizations that are doing, kind of, trying to make this world a little bit better. Um, we talk a lot about removing barriers and reaching their greatest potential. And part of the reason that I named it Capacita is because I really believe in the power of capacity building uh, to make a real difference in what people are able to do, how much they're able to get done. Um, so we assist especially nonprofits with strategy development and then my favorite strategy implementation, which is taking it beyond the just like, here's a you know strategic plan that's 50 pages long and no one's ever gonna look at again to what is it really gonna take to do this? Resource uh, allocation, um, timing, milestones, prioritization, staffing, it really getting into the nitty gritty. We roll our sleeves up, we walk alongside a lot of organizations to get this figured out. We have a particular focus on capacity building along the lines I just discussed, but also fundraising strategy. So we'll get into a little bit about that today and grants in particular. I'll explain why later, because you see we have a special approach that we think makes a lot of sense. Obviously I'm biased, but, uh, Let's get into it. All right. So, oh, you know what I realized though? I, this probably is not going to be very useful today because I can't really see the chat while I'm talking. But if you'd like to share with each other your name and organization, just so we can kind of see where folks are, are joining us from, I think that would be fun. Um, your call. All right. Today, here's what we're doing. This is really what like we're going to be discussing today. How do you make a grants plan that's true to what you're doing, realistic, given the field you're in, and likely to succeed? That is kind of the topic we're gonna just explore today. So very quickly to re reorient you on the way I think about modern fundraising, you know, it's really about soliciting, collecting donations, grants, other forms of financial support to support your the mission and your programs. But I also wanna say, this is as important to a nonprofit as customers are to a for-profit. You do not exist without customers. If you are a business, you do not exist without funders if you're a nonprofit. And I think it's something that uh, is worth just kind of explicitly saying up front. I realize how obvious it is. But I also think there's a lot of kind of ambivalence and awkwardness around fundraising for folks that are either running nonprofits or on the boards of nonprofits. And I think it's worth explicitly saying this is how you sustainably and effectively power your mission fundraising. It, it's, a, it's a necessary requirement of being a nonprofit organization. Now, that's not to say there aren't ways to like. Uh, um, uh, diversify the sources of funding, some of which may come from earned income, but really it's donors that power your mission. Okay, so let's get into it. Surprise, I'm talking to you about messaging, even though you thought this was a grants conversation. No, I'm just kidding. I always start with message because for me, it's almost impossible to be effective with your grant process if you haven't 
taken the time to think about the way you talk about what your organization does. So let me explain what I mean by this. So one of the things that we've noticed, you know, my, my, my team and I spend a lot of time kind of looking at best practice. We work with, you know, tens and tens of clients. And I've also been in this space, as Maria said, for a long time. I've been a funder. I've been on the nonprofit side. I've been a consultant. I've kind of been around a bit. And there's one thing that I look at as an absolute baseline if you're going to be effective in any kind of fundraising, grants or otherwise. And that's on being totally clear on who you are, what you do, and why it matters. And the reason is because of this. This is basically like my thesis slide. <laughs> this is this is like the 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 equation that gets you to you know really effective fundraising. <laughs> and it's focus on getting your story and your pitch as strong as possible. Then use your network or research to help determine who cares about your work. And this is who you want to get in front of. In other words, you want to have something really compelling to say. And then you want to get into in front of the people who care about that. Who are we? And who funds that? <laughs> that is like the underlying foundation for a really effective fundraising strategy. I feel really strongly about this. Happy to have conversations about why I always start with this later if any of y'all have questions. But I think in, in practice, this process of focusing on the, the story and the way you talk about yourselves first is really going to set you up for success later on. Okay. Let's start getting into it. So the funding landscape, before we dive into grants, let me just contextualize them a little bit. So this is the most recent data that we have from the Giving USA annual report. We don't have 2023 yet, but we expect it to be pretty similar. Just to get an idea of like, you know, giving in the United States. So of almost $500 billion in giving and philanthropic giving in the United States, this is a decrease from 2021. And part of the reason that folks think that that happened is because of um, there was a big uptick in giving during the pandemic. And that was kind of regularizing again in 2022. I want you to focus on the next line here. The number one source of philanthropic giving is individuals. Let me point out though, that many of those individuals give via private family foundations. So there is a little bit of like squishiness in these categories, but still the vast majority is individuals, then foundations, hundred billion, then corporate. I also just want to like flag, corporate is a lot smaller than people think. So just throwing that out there. Um, 2021 was that record year of 516 billion. I just want to point out too, I mean, this is just, you know, wealth inequality in America. Um, mega giving from six individuals slash couples is 5% of the $500 billion total. That's just an interesting little fact that, that, that we in the philanthropy uh, uh, and fundraising field are keeping an eye on because it's fascinating. Okay, so in the context of this, yeah, there we go. let's talk about the kind of funding categories and you'll see how grants fits into a bigger uh, context. Okay, so we have individual donors. We think about major donors, annual donors. You're kind of intermittent. Every once in a while, they throw you 20 bucks donors. Um, planned giving and bequests. Campaigns, I know that they are usually, I, I, we like to think about them differently, even though they are usually individual donors, mostly, that are giving to them. They are kind of approached in a different way. We're like, you know, that this is your Giving Tuesday, your annual drive, whatever. They're kind of, the, the resources that you allocate towards it might be a little bit different. So we like to kind of put them into a different category. Events, fees for service. So some example, you know, maybe you run a summer camp, an after-school program, maybe you provide therapy or counseling or job training and you, you charge a certain amount for it. And that helps augment your underlying uh, fundraising. Corporate partnerships, which by the way, I, this does not include corporate philanthropy. This is corporate partnerships. So sponsorship, naming rights, volunteering, maybe they underwrite one of your programs. Corporate philanthropy is where corporations have their own foundations. Slightly different uh, approach. Institutional grant makers. So this is your kind of big foundation type folks, the private or community foundations, governments, and public grant makers. Contracts. A lot of our clients have contracts where they are, you know, providing a service for a fee, uh, and that's a not insignificant way of uh, bringing in funding. And then sale of goods. Um, and this is not exhaustive. I always have somebody like, but what about? It's not exhaustive, but these are some of the biggest ones, just to put it in context. I like to spend a little bit of time on this slide before we get into grants because I want you to understand why we fundraising kind of professionals spend time on foundations and major donors. And you'll hear a lot about them and planned giving. You know, it's because if you look at this on the y-axis, we have high predictability. You can kind of rely on that source of funding. And then on the x-axis, you have how much work it takes to get it. Corporate partnerships, planned giving, less effort, 
not the most kind of predictable thing on this whole chart is planned giving. And that's usually your major donors. So people who really, really believe in and are kind of like your ride or dies for your mission, those folks writing them, writing you into their will, like that is among the lowest effort, highest impact um, ways to fundraise. You'll see high predictability, but a lot of work, government funding all the way out there on the right, foundations near the middle, major donors kind of smack in the middle. That's why a lot of folks spend a lot of time on major donors and foundations and grants. There it is. They're up in that quadrant. Um, you will note, I'm just going to point out, look at events. Events are hard. We can talk about that in another, uh, if you ever come back to another capacitor workshop or you work with us individually, happy to have a conversation with you about why events are tricky. Um, but really it's because low predictability and high effort. Okay, let's get into grants. Oh wait, no, quickly, sorry. I wanna talk to you quickly about this idea of a diversified funding portfolio. So one of the kind of, and again, everything I'm talking about today needs to be applied to your specific situation. Nothing I'm saying today is a definite. I'm not saying that these are the right, you know, proportions for you to have for your organization. No, in general, in general, best practice is that you want to diversify your sources of funding to kind of ensure you're a little more sustainable. You can kind of take the hard knocks of the economy or shifting priorities. And you want to make sure you have different sources of funding as they kind of ebb and flow. This is not, I've never actually, by the way, seen an organization that really has this much of a, of a diversified funding portfolio. It's just an example to show like, oh, let's say you have a lot of all these little things. But I do want to point out a couple of things. Most organizations do have a lot of that comes from major donors, which usually is, is um, defined as the top 20% of your donors, they're considered your major donor categories. And via the Pareto principle, about 80% of your funding usually comes from about 20% of your fund of your funders. And then a lot of organizations have a big chunk that comes from grants. We see a lot that look like this. A lot of our clients that come to us for grants assistance or for kind of fundraising strategy assistance, a lot of them look like this, like mostly grants, individual donors, a big chunk of which are major donors. And maybe they do like an event a year or two events a year. Um, again, I am not saying that this is exactly what it should be. I'm just saying that we see a lot of this. But the idea to show you that grants are often a not insignificant, in other words, an important proportion of, of, of a portfolio for a lot of the clients that we work with, the nonprofit clients that we work with, because they're a great source of funding. Um, and a, a major piece of kind of your decision-making process on your fundraising strategy is determining what level of effort to allocate towards all those different po potential sources of funding. And that's a real conversation that we have with our executive directors and our, you know, our, our nonprofit COOs around what is the right kind of proportionality look like and thus what does resource allocation have to look like to en enable a kind of um, a healthy diversified portfolio of donors. Because again, without donors, you don't exist. Like without customers, you don't exist. Just reminding everybody, even though it's probably very obvious. Um, okay, now let's get into grants. Um, this is what you're all here for after. So let's do some real talk. So on the plus side, grants can really be great, right? They can be a source of multi-year funds. You can get a lot of funding from grants. They can be a solid foundation for any other fundraising you undertake. I often talk about it. So using that pie chart analogy, let's say that you're talking about like an investment portfolio. You know, it's probably, I'm sure if there are any financial people on here, they'd be like, oh my God, Adriana, stop. But grants are almost like your bonds, <laughs> right? Like you can kind of rely on them. Like you just got, if you have a good relationship, with your funders, you kind of know year over year, you're going to get around the same amount or they'll tell you far in advance, like, hey, we're probably not going to be able to fund you again. They're like a very reliable source of funding. The downside, let's be honest, they're a high effort undertaking. It takes a lot of work. And there's a lot of formality that's inherent to the process, right? There's a lot of reporting. There are a lot of like stringent requirements, often not much flexibility. We'll get more into it in a minute, but like, let's just start right out by, by saying that grants are not a panacea. There's pros and cons. Okay. <clears throat> Let's get into like the general different types of grant makers. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but I just want to make sure that everybody, we're all operating off of the same sheet of music. I'm bad with idioms. I'm sorry. Okay. So private or public foundations, these are like community foundations, private philanthropic organizations. Sometimes they're family foundations. They're giving a lot of kind of your traditional grants that you, when you think of as like an institutional grant maker, you're probably thinking of that first category. Second, government, remember federal, state, and local. And I also just want to point out sometimes even like educational institutions like school districts, pardon, will put out grants and they are, they are government grants. Corporate, they have foundations 
that are kind of more, let's put it this way, they're more um, transparent about what they're giving to, who they're giving to. They have to file these IRS forms, the 990 reports, which kind of tell you exactly what they've done. But sometimes corporations also have these corporate social responsibility grants that are just kind of like willy nilly and they don't have to really tell anybody what they're doing or why they give them. But, you know, America. Okay, then there's international and multilateral organizations like UN agencies that give grants. And then there's nonprofits, which give subgrants. So something to think about, you know, if you haven't really considered that, especially if you're a smaller organization, having strong partnerships with bigger nonprofits in your area actually is a really thoughtful, um, strategic way to grow. Today, we are going to spend most of our time in the first two. So let's get a little deeper into the private or public foundations and government. So... <clears throat> the kind of big institutional grants, the foundation and institutional grants, advantage, okay. Potential for large funding amounts. You know, many of our clients are, are you know, I have, I don't know, from 250,000 a year operating budget to like $10 million a year operating budget with some wiggle room um, upwards. And, you know, a lot of them are getting multi hundred million dollar grants every year. So uh, that's not a small thing, you know, and it's, it's often hard to ask an individual for that kind of funding year over year. Often foundation backing can provide legitimacy to other, other donors. You know, we get funded by X, Y, and Z. Oh, okay. You know, it's not a small thing. Potential for consistent funding over time. Often having been a donor myself, again, I was in government, but having been a donor myself, we plan. We plan out in advance. We say, okay, so we're probably going to continue. But again, there's usually some kind of an application process and there's, you know, competition, but you do have kind of a budgeted understanding that you're going to continue to support an organization over at least the period of the grant or, you know, a period of time thereafter. And they are, I mean, there's something about this. They're open, they're public, they're transparent. Uh, uh, major donors are not, <laughs> they're just people. So it's a lot easier to kind of have a shot at foundation grants than to like, you know, meet your friendly neighborhood billionaire and get him to cut you a check. Uh, disadvantages, <laughs> significant staff time required. Star, exclamation point, circle this. They're work, they're a lot of work. And that's part of the reason Capacita exists. Right, the process often needs to be repeated each year. So it's you know you got it, and that's not the end of the story. You have to do it every single year. There's a burden of compliance, reporting, financial and fiscal reporting. Um, even just like the 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 way you keep track. I have a lawyer myself. You know, I'm all about the eyes and the T's. You have to make sure that you're keeping the, the the everything they say you need to do. You're doing it in the way they want you to do it. It's a not insignificant burden, and then they can be specific and restrictive. They're often um, paying for like a program right, or a project, um, and not staff or general operating, which is always our favorite. Okay, and then to get into government funding, the funding amounts can be really transformative. I mean, let's be honest, like government grants are where you're getting into the millions. It's amazing, but, you know, anyway, we'll get into the disadvantages in a minute. The information and the requirements are public and accessible. I remember my first boss at the State Department, she was the most brilliant person I've ever worked for, and she said, you have to understand, because I would pull my hair out coming out of law school going, why is it so inefficient? And she'd say, government is less about efficiency than it is about fairness. And that's something to think about when you're thinking about government grants. They are open. They're open to anyone. So they have to be like rigorously fair and rigorously explicit about what they're looking for and why and how you're going to be judged. And they're telling you all that, you know, down to the, I remember I would run technical evaluation panels and it was the, those of us on the panel, it was like 10% of the score is for this, 20% for this. I mean, that's helpful. You know what you're expect, what, what's expected of you. They'll offer cover some general operating expenses and staff costs. And then up above, it'll also lend some credibility. I mean, you're getting funded by the state or by the, you know, the feds, my God, oh, all right. Again, not a small thing. Disadvantages. Processes require staff, resources, and expertise. It is resource intensive to get government funding. Opportunities are competitive. Remember, they're open. Um, once awarded, it can be difficult to adapt the funding. Again, having been on the other side of this, often I'd have grantees come to me going, X, Y, and Z situation on the ground changed. Can we use the funding for something else? And I'd have to say, no. Uh, that's usually less true for other sources of funding. Um, often paid as a reimbursement of, of expenses. Some folks don't know this. Often gov government grants, will you will have to pay yourselves. So you have to have a high operating kind of cash on hand to be able to go two, three, four months out before you're reimbursed by the government for what you've already done. Political instability can mean that like you got the grant now, but there's a new, you know, a new president, a new governor, a new whatever, a new legislator. And all of a sudden that um, grant funding no longer exists. And then stringent reporting and compliance requirements, way higher burden than uh, even the institutional funders on the previous one. This is 
It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. Okay. This is something that we spend a lot of time with on our with our clients. Um, when folks come to us asking for help with grants, we really want to see that you're grant ready. Okay. So let's start with like you're kind of in a strong position to be ready for grants if you're a 501c3 with full time staff and a formal board. Does this mean if you're a fiscally sponsored project, you can't get grants? No, of course not, but it's gonna make it harder. There's less options for you. Um, clear funding needs for the next six to 12 months. What do you need funding for specifically? It can't just be our operations. That's not good for grants. Grants want more specificity. An identified need in your community. What's the problem you're solving? A mission and vision statement, the required documentation. You know, There's all kinds of lists of things that you need to have ready. If you have that stuff off the shelf, you're ready to start applying. A team member who can manage your grants approach. Somebody, even if you're outsourcing some of it to an organization like ours, you still need somebody on your side that is tracking, that can provide the information, that can do the compliance on the back end. That's not a small thing. And that's why a lot of kind of all volunteer organizations, one of the first things I ask is, are you ready if you get a grant? Like you have to be able to, 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 to deliver on what you're getting the funding for. It's like a contract. Stronger is if you have alternative sources of funding beyond this grant, if you have a history of successful programs and impactful results, and the capacity to implement. As funders, we would often be vetting potential grantees for, if you got this money, could you actually do it? And we're looking at you know the strength of your leadership, the strength of your team, your past performance, your financial controls, your you know whatever it is, we're looking to see, can you actually hack it? I mean, it's not a small thing to give hundreds of thousands of dollars to an organization um, untested. And then strongest, we want to see partnerships with other community organizations. People so undervalue this. It's so, donors love this. They love this. A five to seven year strategic plan that you're actually implementing, strong relationships with funders, and an active board with an expansive network. Let's give you a sense of what the grant seeking journey looks like right now. So really you're gonna start by identifying funding needs. I will go deeper into each of these. Um, you're starting by identifying funding needs. Then you're doing your research and you're vetting and you're making a work plan. Who are we going to apply to? Who are we going to try? Who are we going to do our outreach to? Who are we going to try to apply to? Then you're going to do your funding outreach, your funder outreach, pardon. You're going to start drafting your letters of intent and applications. And then you'll do your reporting and continued engagement with funders. That's the general timeline. It's really kind of a circle, but for, for, for today, I thought I would do it as a map. Okay. Let's get into phase one. So determining funding needs. This is where you want to start on the left here by identifying your organization's funding need. What do you need the funding for? And then making sure that they're grant appropriate. So projects or programs, general operating. Hey, some it's out there, right? We've, we've helped a lot of clients get general operating. It's real. We jokingly call it like the unicorn, but it's really not as rare as the unicorn. But, you know, not all, not all funders do it. Um, capital or construction, you're building a new, you know, a new office or you're re renovating an existing one. Capacity building is usually investment in your current team or your, like your current staff or training or like um, IT systems. Uh, it's like, you know, the, the things you need to do your work better. Then you want to evaluate if the funding needs are grant appropriate. Not all of them will be. And then you prioritize them, taking into account both the organizational requirements and funder preferences. Like we really need this, but funders don't like funding this. So we're going to kind of put it second and we're going to move this other thing up. And it's something that really your leadership, often with, you know, if you have an uh, outsourced grants team, we help with this kind of strategy, but you're doing it yourself. You're going to want to be thinking strategically about prioritization in terms of what you need and what the funders like to fund. And then you want to frame the needs in ways that are compelling to funder. Remember what I said about the importance of messaging? It's so important. <laughs> Do it. So that's that piece. Okay, then let's talk about research and vetting. So I like to, ah, sorry. <laughs> um, I like to start, I have to like move this like thing out of the way, there we go. I like to start with compiling a list of prospects. Now, Capacita, we pay for all of these databases and we have a whole team that does this. It takes us about two months. We go really deep. We scrape the landscape and the environment to see what's out there. You can also conduct your own research using these paid databases. There are, you know, foundation directory online is now called Candid. There's a place called Instrumental. You can do some of your own, you know, uh, uh, Googling and see what you find. Obviously, you know, uh, it's faster and probably more uh, effective, just honestly, if you either pay someone to do it or you pay for those databases and you take the time to learn how to use them. Um, you want to create search terms with keywords from your funding needs. 
right? And your service location. Those are really the two big things. It's where you located because funders like to fund folks in their community and then kind of in concentric circles outwards. And then, you know, you need, uh, okay, let's just use general operating. You need general operating. You're going to want to look for funders who give general operating. And then you want to look at who funds your peers. That's often a good place to start if you're just like, where, what in the world should I do? So if you are a nonprofit, you know you have to file a 990 every year. In that 990, you have to you have to say who gives you funding. If you know who your peers are, you can look at their 990s, see who, see who gives them funding. Start there. You know, there's a obvious, remember we were saying at the beginning that my whole thesis of who are we and who cares about that? You know, who funds that? Well, you have an answer. If they're your peer, you know they care about that. So it's probably a pretty good bet that they're going to be interested in at least hearing from you. Okay. Then once you've done the research, you want to vet the options. You want to vet them in terms of their mission and their funding priorities, their location. Star this one. This is more important than people realize. Eligibility, obviously, are you eligible per their requirements? Their past grantees, are there other grantees? Uh, sorry, are any of your peers on the list of their past grantees? What's the funding range? You know, some folks, uh, we talk to our clients a lot about this. Like, is there a threshold under which it's kind of not worth you applying? Like, it's not worth the work. And a lot of them are like, I don't know, $5,000. It's not even worth it. Some are like 10, some are 50, you know, and it's worth kind of doing that, that uh, decision for yourselves. Um, the deadlines, <laughs> you know, some aren't even going to be open for another eight months. All right, well, let's put them lower down the, down the list. Are they open opportunities or not? A lot of places these days are asking first for a letter of intent before they then invite you to apply. Some places are like, don't contact us, we'll contact you. And in that case, that really is gonna come back to you doing funder outreach, which we'll get to later. To say, wow, they're a really good fit. They don't have anything open. I'm gonna put them on my list and I'm gonna try and contact them um, to try and develop a relation so that later they can ask me to apply. And then you're gonna prioritize your list by best fit, most pressing organizational need, deadlines, and your organizational connections with the funder. If you have a couple of connections there, like via your board or your staff, move that puppy up because it makes a really big difference. Let me get more into it in the next couple of pages. So a couple of do's and don'ts. <laughs> Don't find funders and then create a funding need. This is such a pet peeve of mine, but it's not even just a pet peeve. It is a funder don't. If you are coming to a funder, I've been on the other side of this. I have lots of relationships with funders. If you're coming to us saying, sure, I can make up a program to meet this grant that you put out on the street. Remember what I said about how we're looking at your capacity to implement? We see right through you. <laughs> if you've never done anything like this before, and now you're here in front of us asking us for money to do this thing you've never done before. It's a really hard argument to make. It's a waste of your time to put these grants together. Listen, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen. I'm not saying that you can't ever do it, but make sure if you're doing that, you have such a good compelling reason to do it because it really puts you lower down the priority list and in the, the, the competitive list when donors are looking at, the, you know, at all of the applicants. We wanna see folks that are already doing this work and that want to level up or they want to reinvest or they want to expand or like, hey, here's like, we have this like, you know, um, kernel of an idea based on X, Y, and Z things that we've been seeing in our community. We've already been doing and we have the right team to do it and just give us a little investment in it. That's our favorite thing to invest. In. You want to be proactive about grants a lot. This is hard. I, I want to like actually take a minute to validate that this is really hard because I know, I know having been on the other side of this, nonprofit leaders do not have enough time to get everything done. I know. And it often means that doing this kind of like proactive work for grants is one of those, like, it's not urgent, even though you know it's important, it gets put on the back burner. But if you're only applying to grants that are sent to you, you are not applying to your best fit funders. You're not. And being thoughtful about looking at the, doing the work that we did in the last of like, let's look at the environment. Let's really understand what's out there and then vet and prioritize and then come up with a plan. That's how you get effective like a, a, an effective grant seeking process in place. Create that work plan, right? Come up with like, we, the, this is who we're going to apply to this year. We're going to plan it out. We're going to pace it out. We're going to put it in a organized way. And then that last piece that I said earlier, start by searching closest to home. You know, if you have the kind of nonprofit that's doing work in a, in a community, obviously that's easy. If you're national or kind of remote, I know that's harder. We have a lot of clients like that. There are ways around this. If you can even make a case for some, if you are, let's say, national, but you have a couple of like programs or projects in specific places, use that as an anchor and look to see who are the funders in those places because you're just going to have a more compelling argument that way. Okay, funder outreach. Everybody wants to skip this step. You're not allowed to skip this step. <laughs> I'm not letting you skip this step. If you came to this, that's it. You'll never skip this step again. Um, remember what I said at the beginning. 
the whole thesis, our whole approach, a strategic approach to fundraising in general is you focus on getting your story and your pitch as strong as possible. Remember that, do that first. Then figure out who you wanna get in front of. That's this, that's what we're talking about. You wanna get in front of people who care about what you do. And that's this funder outreach. So you wanna gather information on how each funder prefers to be contacted. Check for connections that will lead to a warm introduction to make such a difference. Organize the email language and other materials you want to share with the funder. For our clients, when we do this, when we get to this phase, we're giving them email templates, we're giving them talking points, we're writing these kind of like prep documents so that the ED or whoever's, you know, development director, whoever's doing this, has it ready to go. And they can go into the meeting kind of knowing what they're trying to get out of it and knowing what the other party really cares about. You want to tailor what you're talking about to the funder. It sounds obvious, but like, again, having been on the other side of these form emails where I'm like, I didn't even get the name of our organization right. I'm like, oh, well, like it's clear that they copied and pasted it. It sucks. Like, don't just if you're gonna do it, do it, do it right. Um, be prepared with your background and talking points. And remember, you're far more likely to be denied by a grant maker if you don't have a pre-existing relationship with them. It doesn't mean that because you have a relationship, oh, you're automatically gonna get the funding. I'm not saying that, but it is far more likely that you will be denied if they don't know you because they've never heard from you before. So even that outreach of like, can I sit down with you? Can I have a, can, can, can I, can I present about our work? Even if there's nothing open right now, I'd love for you to know about what we do. You can ask questions like, what do you want to see in a strong grant application? We see their priorities are X, Y, and Z. What are you looking for in terms of nonprofit partners in those categories? A, a um, curious stance, right? With funders can really serve you. And then it's hard. I want to like, can we take a moment? It's a weird power dynamic. It sucks to be asking for money. Can we just like say it? It's weird. So I really wanna to get to take a moment here to just say there's some power and persistence and perspective around this stuff. So donors know you're gonna ask for support. I, again, I was a funder. I know, it's okay. I knew you were gonna ask me for support. That's your job. It's your job as a leader to resource your organization. You have to get comfortable with that. And if there are any board members on here, you too. Like you have to get comfortable with that. People understand you as part of a member of a board is your fiduciary responsibility to resource the organization that you're on the board of, right? If you're an executive director or a development director, it's literally your job. Um, seeking alignment with their priorities are key, right? We know you care about youth. We are working with the youth of the state. Blah, 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 blah. It's that alignment that's really gonna create a, a personal connection. Persistence, overcome rejection. It's not personal. It's not personal. Just keep going. Don't give <laughs> um, Remember, you're planting seeds. They're not gonna sprout overnight. But developing those relationships with the funders in your geographic area and the subject matter that you that you work in, that stuff, it comes back around. The the the, the seedlings sprout. <laughs> you know, not all of them, but you have to do the you have to do the gardening. This is a horrible analogy. I'm sorry. But you know, you have to do it. Uh, it's a long game. It's a long game. Grants is one of those things that you have a it's a lot of effort at the beginning to kind of if you haven't been doing this. It's a lot of effort at the beginning to get it going. You're getting it going. You're developing a pipeline. You're doing all this work. But the thing about grants, remember what I said about how it's like the bonds of the portfolio. Once you have a nice little network of grants and people know you and the funders know you, it ends up being a really low, not low effort, but it ends up being a, like it kind of moves on its own momentum. The, the key is just, you have to allocate resources towards it. Either internally, you're doing it yourself or someone on your team is, or you're outsourcing it to someone like us, but it has to get done. But it's a long game, right? Pace yourself. You're going to be doing grants. Just get on that road and <laughs> start the outreach. Okay. Next step, actually getting to applying. So letters of intent and applications. So letters of intent, it's usually a short one to three page pitch of the organization and the project. So a little bit about you, a little about, bit about the project. Remember what I said about how it starts with the message. Get this tight, get this, get it beautiful. Get, have people who are not in your organization, read it. Have, you know, people that you trust, smart people you trust, have them look at it. Have them ask you questions about it. Like, it's not clear to me what you guys are actually do or what are your programs? Like, that's the kind of thing you want to have nice and tight in your LOI so that when it goes to funders, they understand who you are, what you're doing. And if they say, yes, please apply, you know, you have a better chance of getting, of, of receiving funding. Applications, much longer proposals. They include specific questions from funders and requirements for attached documentation. Let me get into some best practices around applications. This is from my team. Total shout out. She's probably not on here right now, but my colleague Olivia put together this list and it is the best. Okay. Be clear and concise. <laughs> you know, there's that like adage, I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time to write you a short letter. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't have enough time to write you a short application. A short, well-written application is worth its weight in gold because having been a funder, I'm actually going to read it. 
it's going to be clearer. I'm going to understand what you're trying to do. Um, ensure someone who doesn't know your program or anything about the sector can understand. Don't use acronyms. Don't use things. I mean, if you use them, explain what they are. But I mean, try to use clear language that explains what you're doing in ways that you don't have to have worked in the organization to decipher. Use data and so storytelling to paint the whole picture. And make sure you're weaving the same narrative thread in the application, right? We can kind of tell if you've just copied and pasted things from a bunch of different things and you're just dropping it in because it doesn't read like a like an ass. But trying to make the narrative read like one story, one, like, imagine you're in a conversation with someone. You're starting with some context, you're building it up, you're making the case, you're making the ass. Often we can tell in applications if you're just like drop, 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 drop. And like, wait, what? And what are they, what are we asking for? You look at it at, from a storytelling perspective and kind of a coherence perspective is kind of what I mean. Reflect the funders language back to them. This is key. However they describe it, describe it that way. Not saying, that you're changing what you're actually doing. But I, let's just say they call it youth development and you talk and you say, you know, leadership of children. All right, well, like, you know, use, use the way they say. That was, a bad, that was a bad example, but hopefully you get what I mean. Draft the application in a Word or Google document first. The worst thing ever is if you're drafting in like the portal and then it crashes or something or it reloads. Oh my God, don't do it. Do it in a Word or Google document. It also helps if you have, you know, multiple different people on your team maybe working on it. The way we do it with Capacita, with our clients, is we'll kind of start the whole template in Google Docs, and then we're like, you know, at, at in, at in, um, in the comments, say, hey, we need this piece, or is this right, or da 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 da. It's much easier to collaboratively work on a collaboratively work on a document that way. Check grammar, spelling, and formatting, please. Put it on the other side of that. Keep common documents, drafts, and submittals organized so that you can then, with the next one, you have everything nice, ready to go. You're organized. You know where everything is. You can attach. This may seem obvious, but answer all the questions. There's nothing worse than having to disqualify a really good applicant because they didn't answer one of the questions. I've been on that side of it, and it sticks. Um, have an outsider review and give you some feedback. I know you can't do that on every grant, but when you can, I really do think you get better uh, input and you get a better product at the end. Phase five, let's pretend that you've gotten your grants. Yay, good for you. Okay, that's not the end. <laughs> this part is like almost as important, not almost, I think it is as important as everything else. Keep the connection and the relationship strong. Let me stop here to say, reconnect it back to the strategy. Remember what I said, if you're getting your message strong. Who are we, what do we do, why does it matter? And you're trying to get in front of people who care about that. Well, guess what? Anyone who is a current funder of yours cares about that. You know they care. So you want to keep your relationship with them as strong as possible. It's going to be a lot harder to bring in some new funder than it is to keep one that you know already believes in you. Okay, sorry. Remember, you're sending interim and final reports. I mean, you have to take this stuff seriously. There's nothing, again, I remember... How many times I had grantees and we worked, I worked at the State Department, so I had a lot of international grantees. You know, I get it. They have a lot of stuff going on, but they're not sending us their required reports. Guess what? As government, we were not allowed to let them get another grant from us if they were not compliant with a previous grant. I mean, door closed. Send those reports in. <laughs> um, appreciation. Thank you notes. Here's our annual report. We're putting your name on the website. We're putting your name in the report. Just, I mean, it goes a long way. Site visits. Donors love site visits. They love it. They love being invited to come and see you actually do the work. Even if they can't make it, I really do think you all should be thinking about how, how effective it is as a way to kind of develop that relationship and strengthen it. Event invites, not just your annual gala, like all kinds of events. I think it's really, you want them to feel invested in you. And then inviting them on advisory committees if you have them. Um, just ways of thinking about keeping your, your funders feeling close to you. Okay leveling up. Everything I've told you already is like grants, you know, 102 and 202. Now let's get to like PhD grants. <laughs> I'm such a dork. Okay. Um, this is what really effective grants teams do. They project manage their approach. And let me talk a little bit about that. So, you know, Capacita, we are part of a family of companies, um, ground rule. And all of our companies, including ours, really approach all of our client work with a project management mindset. The idea being or being organized, being thoughtful about like timelines and milestones and how we do the work and how can we do it more efficiently and how can we communicate and that clear lines of kind of responsibility and accountability just makes things work better. 
if you apply that logic then to grants, which I think of all those fund, remember the um the pie chart of everything in that pie chart, grants is one piece where it actually is really um uh, it really takes to project management because remember stuff is posted online. You can see when deadlines are, they're transparent. You can kind of like plan ahead. You understand the level of effort required. This is one of those places where a bit of project management and the way you think about your grants seeking is gonna really take you into that next level, that PhD level. The key is making a fundraising plan that matches the actual funding environment. That's why we have you start with the research. That's why we have you do the vetting. That's why we have you come up with a work plan rather than throwing spaghetti at the wall or like, you know, your board member sends you some like random grant that like may or may not even be good for you or like the classic and how many of you have done this? I wish I could see your faces. Oh, what if we just got Mackenzie Scott money? Yeah, all right. I mean, come on. Like we have, we have to be strategic and thoughtful. Who, yeah, sure. If you're a good fit for what Mackenzie Scott was asking for last year, apply. But make sure that you're thinking about that along with anything else for which you are a good fit and be thoughtful and strategic and plan it out, project manage it out for the year to make sure that you're being consistent in terms of your approach because that's what really gets you across the finish line. Remember, effective strategy is all about thoughtful resource allocation for your fundraising efforts and really your time. Your time is one of the most effective resources that you have, right? And thinking about, I know a lot of the organizations that we work with, especially the ones on the smaller side, it's usually like the ED, or maybe if they have a development person working on these grants at like, you know, 10 p.m. on a Sunday because they realize that it's due and they're doing it on top of like the three other jobs essentially that they're doing. And I think it's one of these things where the way I like to think about it and the conversation that I have with a lot of our clients is if you are the org if you are an organization for which remember that pie chart, grants are going to be a not insignificant portion of your fundraising, well then you have to plan and put resources towards grant seeking. It, it's, a, it's a logical like clarity to me. I mean, again, sorry, <laughs> being very Italian right now. Um, It's very clear to me that if you realize that this is something you have to do, well, then you have to allocate resources towards it. And you have options. You do it internally. You hire somebody on your team. You find a freelancer to do it hourly, or you hire a team like ours. But it's got to get done, right? Again, if grants are not a big part of your, of your work, you probably are not in this workshop. But in, in terms of kind of the allocation of resources, it's the most strategic decision you can make. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now. Well, guess what? We can help <laughs> if you'd like. Um, we work with a lot of organizations across the United States in different sectors, education, uh, criminal justice, uh, oh my God, social services, youth development, sports, I mean, you name it. Um, and I think it's one of those things where it's a decision that I think leaders need to make around how do we want to handle this? Because the things that I outlined earlier, that, that's what's going to have to happen to do it well, to do it well. That's what you're going to have to do. And then you're going to have to look honestly and say, can we do it ourselves or do we need help? And you go from there. We're one option. We're not the only option. We're pretty great though. Questions time. How'd I do on time? Let's see, where are we? Hey, I said about 45 minutes. Look at that. I have not seen the chat because I was so engrossed in this. So let me see if I can. All right, there we go. You did great on time, Adriana. I'm all here for questions. Give it to me. I like spicy questions. Perfect. Um, let's see if we have anything already. I'm going to check with my team and then I can start asking away. It's weird not being able to see anybody. I'm just picturing a lot of people. Yeah. It feels like you're kind of talking to just me or just yourself. I was, you. I was looking at you and Jasmine, basically. Oh, okay. Yes, we have one in the chat. Should I read it or will you? I can read it. Um, so it's, in what ways have you seen recipients allocate funding that have led to the most impact or momentum? This is such a good question. Okay, maybe a better, maybe a way of thinking about this is, because I think what you're saying is allocate funding. You're saying funding towards grant seeking. So this person, if if that is not what you meant, please clarify. But assuming you're saying allocating grant seeking resources, I, I've seen a couple of different things that work. I've seen, obviously, outsourcing to us, duh, right? I've seen people who often, we do this sometimes, where they just come to us for phase one. They just come to us for grant for the research and the vetting, and then they do the rest in-house. That's an interesting way of doing it too, where you're kind of like, I, I know like we have somebody in our team who can kind of apply. We just don't have the time or the resources or we don't want to pay for the databases. So I've seen people do that where they come to us and they say, give us the kind of report and then we'll go from there. 
obviously we I've seen folks who hire a really good grant person in house, right? I think it really depends on the resources that you have to to play with, right? If you have lower resources, I've often seen folks do like let's do the research and let's have somebody in house do it or let's do the research and find like one, you know, hourly person. I will say if you do an obviously we wouldn't exist if this wasn't the case, so bear with me here. Usually one hourly person can't do all the things we do. But usually you can say, you know, let me, can you do these, you know, six this year, you know, I, maybe they won't get as many out or maybe they're not as good at the research or they're not going to help with the compliance or whatever it is. But I think it really has to do with, are you trying for volume? Are you trying for a few really good fit grants? Like you want to get like three really good ones, but here's another thing. It might be, you want to really work on uh, getting this list so that you can do outreach this year, which by the way, is a totally viable strategic approach. So I realized that was not a one answer, but it's a, there are different options to be thinking about when you are thinking about how to, you know, invest your resources, your limited resources. Yeah, you um, have all the options. I love it. Um, the next question is, uh, are you located in Maryland or Mid-Atlantic? I know you guys work all over, but I'll let you answer the question. Capacita is officially remote. <laughs> so we, we have folks kind of everywhere. So um, I'm in North Carolina. I have a colleague just out of D.C., a colleague in Buffalo, a colleague in in Chicago. Uh, we have uh, beloved grant writers who are all over even more. We have one in Newark. We have one in Brooklyn. I'm like, I don't even remember everybody. One, anyway, but all over the place is the answer. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> I know it's not a, we have a, we have a critical mass though of clients. Um, we have a bunch in DC. We have a few in DC. We have a few in New York. We have a few in North Carolina. We have a few in California. I know I'm forgetting people. We have one in Portland. Oh my God, we have so many. We have like almost 30, so I'm going to forget a ton. But anyway, we're all over the place. We do everywhere. Now, national US only. Got it. Um, we have another question here that says, are there any basic rules slash etiquette lines around applying for multiple grants for the same project, especially considering the potential compliance requirements if grants are one? Sina, what a good question. Um, okay, basic rules are, Okay, so assume, okay, so let's put it this way. So assume you you have this project that's kind of like one of your main projects. It's kind of like your your go to. Like I'm just going to use an example for one of our clients. Um, you have like an after school program for kids. I think it is okay to apply for multiple, like to to, to try for multiple um, donors for that same project. The key, the hard thing then becomes, which I have to say, is very unlikely, Sina, that this happens. Everybody says yes, <laughs> and now you have too much funding. If that happens, usually you know about it with enough time to term. It's very rare that you're applying to like six at the same time and all of them have the same deadlines and you're going to hear about it all at the same time. In general, usually they're kind of, a lot of folks are rolling. A lot of folks have, you know, different things. So you can kind of plan out that your asks are always kind of aligned towards how much you know you have right now. That said, I, again, I was a donor. And I remember, I, I loved when this happened, when uh, grantees would come to me and say, thank you, we got it from you. And by the way, we also got it from like, you know, the EU. And I was like, hell yeah, increase it, increase the program, you know? So that is something where I, I would say, Sina, apply for as much as you can. I think then if you do get a lot, then it becomes a, a, a lovely conversation with your donors of unexpectedly, we got more than we expected. How do you feel about us using it on X, Y, and Z if we expanded the program like this or like that? But I have to say, it, it's very unlikely that it would happen in a way that would require you to have an awkward conversation. It'd probably be more like you would be making a decision because you just heard about this one. Oh, great. So then it's next and let's ask for less. That seems to happen more often, but great question. Great. Um, next mm. question we have. Ecosystem support as a fairly new field. Are you seeing any trends in funding this type of work? Jennifer, I love it. Um, yes. So what we've seen, we've just started working with Eco EcoMap on behalf of um, some uh, potential clients. And something that we've seen is, um, okay, so funding funders, there's like, I often kind of think about it as like those pendulum swings. So there was like a little bit of a pendulum swing a few years ago, pre-pandemic actually, around trust-based philanthropy and like, we trust you, so we're just going to give you no strings attached money. And then there's been another pendulum kind of a little bit, it's like swinging a little bit backwards now on that. Another pendulum swing that's relevant to ecosystem support is around wanting to pay for more kind of capacity building grants and like technical like investments in the way a nonprofit does its work. And we look at ecosystem support as something, a very cool, innovative way of allowing nonprofits and schools to do their work in a more efficient, effective way using technology. And we've seen that there are some funders who see that, like who see that connection. So the answer is, yeah. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, funders, 
major donors are usually the most, I'm making some very general statements here. Major donors tend to be kind of the slowest to innovate. <laughs> um, and some of the institutional funders, especially like the really um, uh, active ones tend to kind of like trying out new things. So we've seen some of the institutional funders being like, oh, this is kind of cool. We've also seen some like tech company uh, foundations kind of looking at this again. The, in, anyone interested in innovation, let's put it this way, um, seems to be interested in this as a concept. Good question. Awesome. That was a great question. Yeah, I love seeing the ecosystem grant um, synergy there. Uh, one more question I have from LinkedIn. Uh, where can we find resources around grants? Is there like a database we can check or is there an email listing we can sign up for? For example, government-based grants, for ecosystem builders um, or for economic development? The answer is annoying. I'm sorry, I don't know who asked this, so I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be real with you. There's no one good place to look. It's really annoying. I mean, that's part of the reason capacity exists. So governments usually have to go to their website. So there's a federal government, I'd say there's not much federal government money in this space for this, just FYI, that we have seen. I'm just, I'm gonna save you a little bit of time there. It doesn't mean you shouldn't look, but there's not much. State government, you have to go to their individual state grant website city or county government guess what you have to go to their <laughs> you have to go to their individual website so annoying um uh for grant for institutional grant makers you can pay for one of the databases that i mentioned earlier so a couple of the bigger ones are candid and instrumental um you know there are some others too uh you can you this is way more uh time intensive and you kind of have to know what you're looking for, but you could search individual 990s if you hear of a funder and then you could look up their 990s. Organizations like websites like ProPublica often have like publicly available 990s. They're usually a couple years old. So that was a long way of saying, no, there's no easy way, which is why capacity exists. <laughs> Honestly. Um, I know it's one of those things where like I saw the need and I was like, well, that sucks. Hmm, maybe we yeah. can do it. Yeah, and that's why you guys exist and I love it. That's great. Um, this was very, very insightful and super helpful. I don't think we have any more questions. I don't see any more in the chat or from LinkedIn. Um, oh, sorry. One more just came in. Okay. Take last your time, question. everybody. I'm I'm chilling. You have me until one. Great. Awesome. Okay. Last question. Um, unless anything else comes in, how long should we plan for grant applications from start to submission? <laughs> oh, okay. So my my team would say the more time the better. <laughs> And I will say the more complicated the application, the longer the time. So I will say federal grants. Oh my God. If you can have six months, take it. Four months, at least 90 days minimum for federal. State is often as complicated as federal. So I'm going to say like months, four months, um, even foundation grants. We love having like two months. And even then, by the way, let me, let me also say that's with us. We are all grants professionals and we're project managers. We are like on top of it. We know what we're doing. We have like the list. We have the template. We're like in Google. We're like, you know, we made you, if you're our client, we've already made you give us all the like off the shelf stuff. And, you know, you don't have a document. Let's help you write it. And we already did that. You know, so let's say you don't have all of that. Let's say, let's say the person who wrote this, I have no idea if you are, you've never applied for a grant before. <laughs> well, if you've never applied for a grant before, probably six months, because remember what I said, you want to have your message so like, I want you having your message tight and getting those off the shelf things that you know you're going to need, having all of that kind of ready to go. And then you pick up an, a specific grant application and you start to answer it. If you get a grant application and then you go, all right, what do I want to write for this? What do I need? What do I need off the shelf? It's not going to be as good. It's just the truth. It's not going to be as effective as if you get your ducks in a row first, then go look at grant applications because you're going to be pulling from stronger uh, base material. If that makes sense. That makes perfect sense and super helpful for people that are probably at like different levels of applying to grants. So there's, great. There's awesome. a range. And it's one yeah. of those things where there's no there's no downside to trying out a few grants that you think are a good fit because you're gonna learn. You are gonna yeah. learn. And even a declination, yeah. even a no from a funder, you can you can circle back and say, we'd love feedback. That's not nothing. And I have to say we work yeah. with many clients where we, we, we start working with them the first time, they, it was a cold connection. They didn't know the funder. They got a no, but guess what? Next time we applied the following year, they got it. You know, yeah. I think it's just worth like planting those seeds. Absolutely, absolutely. This is the last question from Ecomap, not really a question, but can you just share with the audience real quick how to get in contact with you and the Capacitive team? Yes, 
how to signing off. I had it on the thing, but I'm going to put it into the, hold on, put it into the chat, everyone. Perfect. I know Perfect. Jasmine's not your LinkedIn and your website as well. That's my email. I Great. love questions. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Follow-up questions. I think I was like a teacher in my past life. I'm like, yes, this is the class. Of yeah, I love it. To email me, anybody. And our website's there. Our LinkedIn's there. Yeah. Perfect. We're very happy to hear from anybody who's interested in our work. Obviously. Perfect. Well, with that, um, I think that's all. And it was great having you. Thank you so much. It was super insightful. Um, and we can share the recording with the group afterwards. Um, thank you so much for your time, Adriana. Great thank talking you. to you. Thank you, Nico Matt. Bye. Bye, everybody.